episode, I'm sure some of you are familiar with devices such as Alexa, Google Homes. I'm sure some of you have them. Uh, wonderful listening devices at home. It's kind of been interesting to see the growth of these devices over time. Actually, there's, there was a kind of a, a recent bug in the Alexa, which I just found hilarious where it randomly laughed, but you, I'm sure you could kind of discuss uh, that. But uh, I'm going to go hand it off to Mario to moderate the panel on uh, kind of the intersection of open source and the conversational techno technology. So uh, feel free to see it. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, uh, conversational web, um, that's... Uh, our topic, and, and of course we want that web to be open. Um, what is the conversational web? We try to figure this out here in the panel, and a um, few more questions. Um, ah, okay. So, um, yeah, I'm the panel moderator here. I'm also happen to be one of the first Asia founders. And our panelists are Michael Christen. Michael Christen, founder of Suzy AI. Please come on stage. Michael is the founder of Suzy AI, but uh, also a lot of other projects like Lockrock. He's the creator of the peer-to-peer -peer search engine Yassi. He's a big data engineer, consulting for some of the largest corporate players in Germany on search technology and di digital transformation strategies. He's uh, also the architect of large search portals like the German Digital Library. Welcome, Michael. Please sit down. Um, then we have... Ken Friedel, data scientist um, at Daimler, uh, please join us. <laughs> Ken is sh shaping the field of product data management using analytics and AI methods. He was born to a German-Japanese family, raised in Germany and spent some time working for several enterprises and research facilities in Japan also before working as a research associate uh, in robotics at the uh, Technical University of Munich. So thank you very much for joining us. And last but not least, Rasmi Ranjan Mohapatra. Please join us. <laughs> Lead technologist at uh, OCBC. Um, it's a bank here, uh, famous in Asia, in, um, in Singapore. Yeah? And uh, your primary background is in data analytics, system design, and product management. Secondary background covers engineering, quality assurance, user, user experience, infrastructure operations, information security, and customer support functions in both corporate and startup environment. You're currently leading te the uh, technology stack at the Open Vault. It is uh, OCBC's bank's fintech and innovation group. So um, you have uh, listed a lot of uh, uh, interesting subjects uh, in this area and uh, um, like interest in corporate innovation, applied machine learning, um, blockchain, uh, of course as a bank, right? And uh, um, yeah, your current interests are uh, with chatbots and actually that's very interesting for us uh, then as we want different people here on the panel. So thank you and uh, welcome and we go back to the... Um, um, introductory slide. So um, <coughs> actually uh, it's a very interesting group that comes together here because uh, with uh, different uh, backgrounds here and uh, what we see uh, with open source uh, um, it, it went to a lot of uh, areas like uh, backends um, and uh, um, yeah we have open source browsers, we have open source in many different areas on technology so the question is now with the conversational web. How I would say the conversational web, what is it? Well, we had the graphic user interface web, say traditional browsers, but we see people are more and more talking to devices. So it's kind of an evolution, whereas the graphic user interface, it will not go away, um, but we have the conversational interface on top, or maybe for certain use cases. So what's happening in this area and uh, um, how do you see uh, uh, possibilities of open source? These are some of the questions here. Um, but maybe we go around first uh, a little bit, like maybe you talk us, uh, you tell us a bit about your personal interest um, uh, of uh, like chatbots and um, like uh, AI applications um, in your area and what is your personal interest? Okay, yeah, so yeah, yeah, Ramsey. Uh, 
Rasmi, actually, sorry. Uh, Rasmi, thank you very much <laughs> for correcting. Actually, like, uh, today also somebody said to me, like, oh, everyone said the German name's wrong on the first day, yeah? Um, so my interest in AI uh, comes from my, my schooling background. So I was a PhD student uh, doing computational biology. And I started as a uh, looking into gene regulatory networks, how the time series data of genes uh, are behaving for a time. And then we are correlating them to produce some proteins and molecules that in the future can be correlated to a, a drugs. Right? So that's where I started. Uh, then I moved into industry, but uh, industry is a different kind of environment altogether, right? Uh, so the first experience, let's come to the point, conversational web, right? Uh, the world has always been uh, seeing the web interfaces in terms of a GUI, always, right? You type in, you get a search result. That's where Yahoo started out, became a big hit. Then Google came and simplified nothing, right? Then you get a top uh, rank, the top 10, top 10 relevant, or top 5 that you are interested in. Now the modern generation is even bored with that. They don't want the top 5 to be there. They just want the first keywords that is relevant to me. So I see it as a, as a, as a gradual evolution of, of the way people want to interact with, uh, with the systems that they have, including mobile. Um, and as the way you started it out, basically not all the use cases will be conversational. Nobody wants to tell that my account number, da da da, da uh, please transfer this amount because people will be hearing it. Uh, but there are use cases, for example, um, Alexa, Play, Spotify. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to go, click, and then do it. So this kind of conversational interfaces will be more common and common. Uh, there was just a session about cars and how to uh, 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 automate them, right? So it's already there. And um, amount of use cases that is going to be in future, it's tremendous. That, that's what my personal belief is in. Ken. Well, I think that works. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Conversational UIs. Uh, so you, you're from Daimler. You're, you're working as a researcher a lot, but you also connect with uh, other teams at Daimler. So you're in a very good position. You have an overview uh, uh, of ma many uh, projects that are going on. Um, what's your take uh, on, on, on conversation web? I know like Daimler released uh, M Box uh, in English. Maybe you can tell us more about like uh, what's going on. Yeah, so um, I'm basically working in the field of uh, product data management at Daimler. So we are interested in, so first of all, what is product data management? It doesn't sound very sexy, but it's basically connecting all the data that is generated in the process of developing a car and also in the process of uh, producing and later on using the car. That's the important part where it comes to the interface with the customer. Um, so we are trying to manage this data in terms of a digital twin. So you have a, a digital copy of the car from the beginning where it's manufactured to the end where it's basically, well, destroyed. And of course in the middle where it's used by the customer. Um, so my first interest in conversational, in chatbots, came actually um, personally because I had a, actually I ha I, at home I have a small R2D2 robot like 40 centimeters tall <laughs> and I wanted it not to only run around and uh, do slam which I had originally on it um, but also to talk to me a little bit and I was motivated by the story of Eliza and then I thought okay <laughs> I can also do that maybe um, the uh, so originally I had a TensorFlow a chatbot on that and then uh, just talking about the weather and then I abandoned it because then I got a new job <coughs> But anyway, so in terms of uh, Daimler, we're interested, as far as my understanding goes, there's like three different types of chatbots. So first is the service chatbot. So you can ask questions about, uh, yeah, the, some sort of manual. Uh, in terms of Daimler, we have a, um, Ask Mercedes, for example, the app that was launched end of last year uh, in several markets, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, South Africa. And um, so you have an AR overlay over the cockpit and then you can see uh, if you have not been a Mercedes uh, driver before, w for example, how do you charge your phone or uh, how do you uh, activate Vipers or anything. Um, 
in my case, uh, in my professional environment at Daimler, we, this is, we are interested in the second type, which I would call the process-oriented orient chatbot, where you're trying to teach, where the chatbot is basically a teacher teaching um, uh, a person how to deal with a certain program. Yeah, I mean, these processes can be very simple, like just get a, a vacation permit, start end date and that's it or they can be very complicated processes such as uh, developing a new part in a CAD environment um, and personally again coming back to that I'm of course interested in the third uh, chatbot that I think is a entertainment chatbot so you can talk about whatever you like um, to uh, yeah, a device or in my case to my R2D2 <laughs> Actually, originally I had even, uh, there's this R2-D2 translator online. I had converted the text output, just for fun, into R2-D2 text output, but I couldn't understand it. So like beeping and something. But of course, there's another topic for translations uh, for chatbots. It's, it's, uh, and then I had a, a, a male voice on it, and then a female one. It all sounds awkward. It's actually, the, the original voice would be the, the beepings, but uh, anyway, okay, humans can't really, and I can't really learn that language uh, anymore, so yeah, getting back to the original voice. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you very much. But uh, you, you, you call that uh, chatbots, and uh, maybe that's something that uh, Micha also has a take on. Uh, is it like chatbot? Is it uh, something more, a framework? Or uh, you are working on the conversational web uh, with Suzy AI. Uh, what are you doing there and, and, and what is it? Like how, how, how does it come into play here? Yeah, I, I was always fascinated by uh, thinking machines and when I was a student, um, I uh, student of computer science, I, I concentrated on uh, logic and deduction uh, of um, automated proving systems and programming in, in Prolog. So um, this is um, now a nice coincidence that uh, after uh, many years when I did uh, search engine technology, I was um, with Yassi and, and uh, Lockluck, I was thinking about an additional layer where we can have an, a logic processing of search results. So, uh, Susie is now the, the latest baby of open source uh, projects. Um, which I'm working on, and it's actually the realization of, the, of this idea that uh, having a, a search engine aggregation service with a logic layer thinking about the results. And it's, it's like, um, it's not like a chat, chatbot, it's like an expert systems on information in the web. And, and it's a, a really good coincidence that now the conversational web is exactly in that field where we can uh, create uh, uh, tools in that field, creating expert systems about topics people want to talk about, getting information uh, from the web and so on. So this is a, a, a really uh, interesting field to work on with a, a kind of um, um, thing that's, that's coming f uh, truly from artificial intelligence uh, theory. So um, um, the conversational web as a um, replacement of user interfaces with, um, with just the opportunity to talk is, um, is, is an amazing field where we don't know where, it, where it's going because it's like in the big beginning of user interfaces where we didn't have a standard way to communicate with a program where, where there was the invention of, of a dialogue so it's not a standard way to click through a status to reach a specific goal that the machine is doing what you want to, but it's a dialogue system so you can, it's, it's like speaking with the machine with a graphical interface. And now we are speaking with this machine with natural language. So there are no standards and we, we, we could uh, create a foundation of what a standard could be doing this. So, um, Ramji, uh, uh, at the introduction of Chris here, we had, uh, he mentioned like Alexa, uh, Google Assistant, and um, so Cortana, Siri. Uh, they are the solutions of these uh, uh, established players, um, and um, they are trying to all push their own, right? I mean, like, uh, what is your organization already uh, uh, using 
any of these technologies? Are you are you working with startups or with OCBC directly? Um, uh, um, like, do they already have apps or in this area? So this is a pretty interesting topic for financial institutions, right? Because if you talk about uh, uh, any banking or financial institution as such, data for them is very, very critical. It comes under regulatory purview. Uh, you lose one data, you have to get a fine, your reputation is at risk. Uh, so banks are looking at these chatbots as a, as, a, as a retail point of view. Uh, when I say retail, it's basically day-to-day -day customers doing their internet transactions. The chatbots or the conversational uh, web as we are talking about, this is no way, in our point of view, is going to touch upon core banking system. And when I say core banking system, it's like huge, huge machineries that is actually running the bank. So it's pretty much on the front. Uh, now, talking about what OCBC is doing, so uh, we started up uh, FinTech and Innovation Group, the group I present, uh, just two years back. And uh, Chatbot, in the first year itself, it has been a very high point for us in terms of KPI to develop that capability inside. Um, so from the day one, I was involved in the way to have that understanding how to build a Chatbot. Obviously, the answer was, uh, Google, Facebook, they want to do it because they are data collectors, right? Now you are conversing, you have no idea whether Alexa is listening to everything that you talk in your home, or uh, it is basically listening to exact question. Uh, but that's the business model, right? So for us, for us, it's, the, for us it's more, more critical in the way that we listen to what means to us, right? So we are not going in the hardware development, like uh, develop a smart speaker and then make it like OCBC speaker. And that's your banking friends henceforth, not, not like that. But we, what we are doing, yes, it will be more on web. It will be like a web pop-up where you can query very specific questions. For example, uh, we, we, we work with startups uh, because it's very difficult internally bringing in this. So the whole world, the uh, banking sphere, they are collaborating with the startups to get all this knowledge. So we work with a startup uh, which is based in Spain, uh, and we created something called MI. So anybody is an OCBC customer, and they have recently applied for a SDB or home loan, they might have gone through this process. So it's basically a web interface. You talk to EMA, and EMA will be guiding you that what are the loan application procedures collect very minimal information that doesn't uh, violate any regulatory norms, name, address, not your account information, et cetera, et cetera. It directly links you up to the relationship manager's database. Next day, relationship manager comes. The, the information that we collected about the customer is updated, and a call can be directly made. So what's happening now is uh, in, in one and a half, years before a customer, if he wants a, if he wants a loan, he will actually call OCBC and OCBC will be assigning a relationship manager, then you start your conversation. But now the whole chunk is gone away, right? And we have, uh, the returns are pretty high. Uh, we have already gathered more than 100 million from this channel. Uh, the user and customer acquisition I'm talking about. Uh, yeah, that. Apart from that, there are other chatbots that we are working on, but uh, I would like to keep it confidential for now. It's cooking up. Yeah. It's cooking up. But like, uh, yes, but we are very interested, uh, of course, this is a tech conference also, in, in the technology stack uh, that you are using. And uh, um, yeah, what, what, what kind of chatbot is it? I mean, how much AI are you already applying? I mean, um, the definition of AI changes over time. Uh, so uh, um, they are much higher, like, uh, expectations nowadays, let's say. And uh, so that, that would be interesting. Could, could you give us some, some insights here? Is it rule-based rule or like how, how far did you go already implementing these services? Right. I will classify it in the category of semi-supervised kind of uh, environment. Um, because the way we are not going into deep learning modules, the customer can query anything and we have all the information to pump into that chatbot. Uh, in my opinion, the only guy who can do it very beautifully will be Google. The reason for that being they are crawling 
each and every information, be it in white web or dark web. They are crawling each and every information. So they have the databases of that in a structured tree, graph, whatever you want to call it. They can go into it to the granularity level of treaties, zero level, and then pull up that information. But for us, investing those amount of money uh, to showcase our retail customers that we can do the business doesn't make sense. And I think uh, it will be same for all uh, banking and financial institutions as well. The, of course, the industry is evolving. Uh, at certain point of time, there may be a technology which will be able to just put that SDK in your platform. It crawls through your entire database as possible, makes a giant uh, graph of it. Now you query at any point in the end of this graph and it goes to the other end of the graph and puts that information. That will be awesome. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. But probably we are more than 10 years or 20 years away from having that kind of uh, neural networks who can fetch anything. Uh, so the perspective that we are going into is make it very specific and make it semi-supervised. Uh, so what I mean by that, define the problem statement very, very well. And that means in technical words, define the keywords. So in the world of NLP, uh, the synonyms and acronyms and the way a semantics of a word is developed in the data dictionary is very, very important. If you are not accurate enough to develop that, you are literally not able to answer the questions. It is, it's like the conversation will be broken. You, you go one by one and then, sorry, I can't answer you. That's, and then you close the chat board because nobody is interested to have even one wrong question and they, or not, not wrong maybe perfect question, but the chatbot replies like, sorry, I'm unable to understand. Me personally, I close it because I think the chatbot is not smart. I think people also do that. So in order to have that very concise, to the point answer, uh, the strategy that we are looking uh, is uh, make it semi-supervised and define the problem statements. Keyword, practice it in forms of a pen and paper drawing board first. The way you will ask questions. Though we are talking about AI, but nothing beats the background of a domain when it comes to, com comes to building such uh, enterprise level applications. Yeah, you can have fun uh, going through it in home. It, there may be some answers, but if you are actually serving customers through this, you better make sure that it is 90% accurate. Otherwise, nobody is going to use it. It's, it's lost interest. Yeah. No, I also heard many people said actually below 90% is not usable. And, uh, um, yeah, I find it very interesting. So uh, the, the uh, security and privacy uh, um, topic, that's, that's one reason that you can't just send all your data to Google. Uh, I guess that's uh, obvious to many people. And uh, um, this is a question for many companies here. So, Micha, is that one thing you're trying to develop? Uh, you, you say you come from search engine technology. You're, you're developing the SUSE II framework. Is that, is that what you want to cater for, like uh, companies like OCBC? the beautiful uh, SDK that you just run and uh, they will deploy it and use it and it just works? Yeah, if, if you say uh, Google is the only company doing this, but would, you, would you use the Google service into your own company to solve the problems of your customers? Because this, it gives too much private information from the customers to Google and you would first have to ask your customers, do you want that all the information you put in is sent to Google? So you ob obviously Google is able to do this, but it's not the first choice if you, if you want to implement that service. So, uh, but uh, actually you're true, Google has so much information that all these big problems uh, can be solved there. But it, um, as I, I'm working in the open source uh, area for a long time, my approach is that uh, if if this task is important enough, then the community um, wants to do the hard work. So if, if it's about collecting synonyms, um, I hope that uh, the community catches up this work and is doing that work. So um, I don't know if it works. But uh, <laughs> um, so what, what's always important uh, in, in, in open source development is that it's a truly a thing that you can give people and it, they implement it in their machines, in, in their homes, and maybe send it to Mars because they don't have a, a cloud access to, uh, to Google. <laughs> and um, so 
being independent is, is one of the, the, the key elements of every uh, open source element. So I try to implement this in, in, in SUSE as, an, uh, as a thing where people can extend the, the elements uh, of it. Yeah, but still hard work and big companies are in a better position to solve these big problems. Um, can what insights can you give us uh, from Daimler? I like Ramsey also said like uh, some parts are confidential. It's like uh, not ready for announcements. But uh, you released uh, uh, different uh, conversational interfaces recently um, at Daimler. Um, you're also developing your own system. So uh, the, the question is how does an enterprise work like Daimler work together with uh, open source software? No. Well, the, the question is like MBUX, for example, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, I couldn't get so much information online, actually, what's the technology behind mm -hmm. um, and, and how you develop it or who, who are your partners uh, mm -hmm. um, in this project. Um, so so um, like h how does it work? Why, do, why don't you just take Alexa? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and and use it and say, okay, we, we implement an Alexa skill. Also, what you said, it sounds like, like okay, you have a very good skill. Yeah, why, why don't you just do that? So I think, generally speaking, for an enterprise, it's, um, so you need to know what is your core that you want to protect, right? I mean, if you use uh, Alexa services or Google services, I mean, commercial services of companies which are largely interested, of course, collecting data, then you need to ask yourself if that data for the company is of a very high value that you really want to rather keep it um, and then work on, on it by yourself. And then solutions like Zuzi AI would help here, of course, because like, I mean, the, so it's not the core technology of Daimler to develop chatbots, yeah. But, um, the, uh, but these chatbots would definitely collect data that would be very, very important to the company and that could be worked on later on. Um, so I think it's a, um, as long as the, you know, I think open, soft, open source helps in this way because like you can really define the technology to have the conversation and to basically have an API between what's going on internally and, and what's externally and um, it's a better way to, to tackle those things than to use, well, software that is um, produced by companies which are mainly interested in collecting data. So, okay, so we are here at, at FOSS Asia, so uh, free and open source software. Um, so, of course, we always want to know uh, what will be the future, what will be the answer, how will uh, the, um, the open source community uh, prevail in more and more areas, yeah? And we, we've seen a lot of successes, um, but also we've heard from some people that in, in s some areas things are moving back, yeah? Like some people said, like, now it's hosted on a few cloud services, yeah? Uh, and uh, so the question is, will the conversational web be open or not? Well, uh, I can tell from a perspective of a, of a user as well, um, Okay, so I have one device and now uh, I use this device at home and this device uh, knows my preferences and, and knows the music that I like and I don't have to uh, have a long sentence. I, uh, sometimes I shorten the sentence, it still understands what I want because it, it learned, like, like it, it understood me better by my pronunciation or whatever. Uh, now I go in the car and there's another device, it doesn't know my preferences, I, I say continue playing my song, yeah? Uh, can't play my song, it's not connected with the other device, it's a separate service. Yeah. Now I go to the banking website and say, uh, yeah, I've already authenticated three times today. Now the bank tells me, okay, type in this number. Yeah. Uh, why can't I just say, okay, um, I authenticate with a keyword and with my voice? Yeah. I mean, depending on the um, on the level of uh, security, you can actually use more and more uh, uh, ways to authenticate yourself. So voice could be one additional one. Yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, so these are the questions, yeah? I mean, even like not, pro not open source or different proprietary ones, uh, yeah, are we not again look, aren't we again looking uh, at, a, at a 
place where just a few players will dominate the market and you have to participate in that like you know like just with the browsers yeah many years we had to support ActiveX banks had to support it yeah and uh, uh, could this happen again will this happen again with the conversational web um, what's your take on this well my short answer is yes it's going to be dominated by big players uh, uh, but uh, that's how the reality of the world is and the reason for that um, because the way you are explaining it's, it's like a it's a, it's, it's a lifestyle adoption you wake up your wake up is let's say Alexa wakes you up and then you go to kitchen Alexa tells you how to squeeze a lemon <laughs> <laughs> or you tell it <laughs> or, or do how to boil the milk and then then you drink and then you come to your car the same ecosystem and what I mean by ecosystem it's it means essentially you have to tap onto the same players all throughout your life and these are core business for these people uh, if you talk about Alexa it's Amazon big giant if you talk about Google again big giant Facebook again one big giant so whether a, a car company or a bank will prevail through this uh, the answer will be very hard to say now now um, the reason for that being these are companies which are not in the same core businesses they are competing they're not competing with each other and hence there will not be a single entity or a government or regulator telling them henceforth you guys do this well the situation is changing like in Europe uh, GDPR the new new regulatory norm has come up the so-called explainable AI so what does it mean it means uh, let's say you are applying for a credit card and your credit card got rejected uh, so the, now the customer can query to the bank and the bank is regulatory liable to answer all the points why the credit card was rejected similarly in future when all this conversational wave is coming in uh, I'm just going in back one one step back uh, Zuckerberg was apologizing yesterday right because he collected some data he shouldn't be so now what's happening you are if you are listening to each and everything of the person's life and you want to have that big uh, moment of time that usability is questioned I don't think so it will, it will be very very hard to do uh, and hence uh, there will be very discreet players who are who are good in that particular segment of industry uh, that's going to happen that's my point. thank you um, can you look very contemplative <laughs> <laughs> right okay Yes, what, what do you think? So I, I think, so I mean, we are just at the start, I think, with, with, with chatbots. I mean, also for Mercedes, Ask Mercedes is one of the first things, uh, many more things to come. We are also at a start at the, um, at the new way of thinking coming from a company that is, the main product is the car or the van or the truck um, to a company that has also is more service oriented and software based. So, and one, one important issue here is, of course, the data. Because like, it, the, the question is, again, is that the data, is that representing a core part or a core interest of an enterprise? Um, because data is money in the end, right? And, uh, I mean, okay, I personally think there should be some regulatory instance here which, which, or some agreement between enterprises to which extent can the data be shared? Or, I mean, there should be, of course, in terms of usability, the, the best would be all the data is at some central place, right? But then the question is, who does that belong to? And, or is it, is it a, uh, you basically have a big data lake, a uh, whole bunch of companies throw something in, and by the percentage of data, you can say how much, uh, you know, revenue is, is, is uh, getting from that. Um, but here we are again at a very uh, early stage, so it's very difficult to say. I think, um, I don't know what will really happen in the future, but definitely in terms of usability, there should be something like this, um, sharing the data among enterprises. Um, and also defining very clearly for companies who are not originally from the software, uh, from the IT part, that uh, what is the core um, in this field. Um, yeah. So, 
we also hear that like a sales argument for uh, for for enterprises and for customers is uh, uh, if the partner or the the seller stores less data yeah so even, so even like i'm i'm as a customer say okay i go to this company they store less data of mine but like we need this data so this is a funny thing we need this data to make all these services work um, however, like the question is which data it really has to be stored, like let's say on the server of the company, or could actually clients store the data? Yeah, could, I mean not the data, many different forms of data, but like are there um, uh, architectures, uh, um, could we think of architectures technologically um, that, uh, that store like data on the client? Uh, for example, like let's say you have uh, you also mentioned another advantage uh, open source you have the code so you could actually say are they what are they really doing what they are saying yeah so that's open source but like could we say for example like some personal data like what song was played last on another channel let's say is stored uh, uh, on my client and i'm going to the car and the car maybe uses another infrastructure or another company but it can say okay this was the last song continue that song or something like that um there's a big problem with uh, the usage of uh, a large data set or the uh, data in a data lake you have. In that area where, where we are talking about, it's all uh, about personalized data. And um, there's a new law in, in Germany saying that you are only allowed to store data if it's related to a specific service you are offering. If you're not offering a service using that data, you're not to, uh, allowed to store that data anymore. And as far as I see, the approach of companies is now not to delete the data, but to offer new services which are using all these data elements. So it's a, <laughs> it's a, uh, so there's the need from many companies to create new services because then they are allowed to store the data. And uh, I would like to catch up on an, an idea you had um, uh, about uh, what happens if you're using your personal assistant in your home, then you go to your car and then your bank and uh, this is this would mean that the personal assistant moves its state information from one instance to another. Uh, either we need a standard to move a kind of mind state of your personal assistant and furthermore uh, maybe you don't need to go to the bank anymore because you can send your personal assistant to the bank but then you need to hand over all your keys to the personal assistant as well. So this is, there are many open questions like uh, how can we create standards there and how can we create security and um, um, uh, so that, that, that's a difficult field and um, another point I want to mention is that um, personal assistants um, are gateways to markets so if you if you uh, if you're in a hometown uh, uh, if if you create a pizza if you have a, a pizza restaurant and you're sending pizza to customers then uh, if, if one of the customer has an Alexa uh, device and says uh, Alexa please send me a pizza then it's not necessary anymore that you are creating a very good pizza but it's necessary also that Alexa knows that you are there so um, the other way around, the personal assistant providers are now choosing what kind of products are in the market and are, are available to the customers. And then they use your, your personal preferences <laughs> and uh, so this goes all together in, into a big problem, how, how can we make this inter, interoperable uh, all together without losing privacy uh, for the people. So, um, yes, interesting ideas in the standardization committees and, and we see like examples in, in other areas. Um, but my question would be, how could like, let's say, uh, an, an independent body, how could that be funded? So apparently like the big ones, uh, as you say, they, they are the big, at the beginning, things are still at the beginning. So I think like, it seems to me everyone wants to push through their solution. They also don't care about interoperability. Yeah, so you create a skill on one channel, it doesn't work on the other. Yeah, so uh, I don't know. So that was the strength of open source. Yeah, when I look at the browser wars, yeah, uh, uh, in the end, like openness prevailed. 
So uh, how would that work out here? Yeah, I mean, like uh, we had Netscape uh, and they got like this big funding and started like uh, uh, Firefox or Phoenix at the beginning. So uh, in regards to the open conversational web, if we actually want to pursue this kind of idea, how would we do that? How would we? Because it, it seems it seems to me like it costs a lot of money. Yeah, standardization committees. They have to meet. They have to get together. Uh, they have to talk to companies. Uh, it's 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 a process. Mozilla was able to do that, um, but yes. The, the browser bar was about breaking a standard. Now, all the browser providers uh, actually created new uh, HTML tags. So uh, people would choose to, to use these tags and then th that browser was the only one to show it in the correct way. But uh, here we don't have any standard at all. The, everybody is doing th their own thing, so we need a standard uh, for the conversational web. How to, to have a user interface process standardized. standardized. I think uh, when we're talking about conversational web, the last word is still web, right? So we haven't, we haven't really gone out of that browser era yet, yet. Uh, and that conversation on what is happening, it's still a lot on the web interfaces, right? And again, to backtrack on the standardization, it's always about the data. Uh, the current winners in the browser era, uh, be it Chrome, or Internet Explorer, Incorporates, or whatever it is, it's still revolving around the idea of marketplaces. Uh, it's still revolving how you can create an app for developers, how you can provide an uh, integrated ID that is web interface. So you are providing more channels through your web interfaces. Even Google created the Chrome ecosystem, Chrome laptops, it's, it's on web. Uh, it's all about data at the end of the day, right? So again, there is no standardization there itself. The more these guys are getting, of course, the more and more services will be coming from them. I think it's only since last couple of years that uh, governments, particularly in Europe, are started looking at it, and they have started finding. Uh, Google was in deep trouble of $12 billion just one year back in Europe, right? And uh, lots of legal questions. Government is now looking at the valuation of data itself. Uh, so once the initial standard of how computing itself is happening, that comes through, then it will be all tangled up in, into, into a more coherent, holistic point of view. And that will define all use cases-wise, because standardization cannot be generic. If you make a generic standard, better not make it. People will have ways to <laughs> go through it and create their own standard. Um, that's where the beauty of open source comes in. Um, so it's very difficult to understand how this ecosystem will play unless maybe if, 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 if in this panel there was a government body, <laughs> somebody like uh, in Singapore they, there is IMDA, uh, from, uh, Media Development Agency, I guess. So these guys basically are the owner or GovTech of data. So this probably they are looking upon valuation of how this government uh, rules and policies are changing around the ecosystem of these big players. So the answer, very complicated, uh, no idea. So um, if we think about like uh, business models uh, that uh, um, would like encourage open source or let's say like an open source business model that's not based on data, how would that look like? Is that actually possible? Or because if it's not possible, what, what I see in like projects that succeeded, mainly they have like different bodies. They have uh, they have community, of course, uh, but like they also have different like sometimes one company, sometimes different companies. For example, the Debian uh, uh, community, like a lot of companies offer services. Like it's a very healthy ecosystem. But uh, if we don't see any like commercial way, because open source people tend to like say, okay, let's collect less data. But if if that's where the money is, so how open can we be? Like what what open stage can 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 we reach? and how successful can open source be? Yes. Ken, okay, Ken, why not? I mean, okay, there's two questions here. One is um, the privacy, and also can we go to, I mean, generally we should ask ourselves, like what is, what do, how is the relationship between the user and his or her data? I mean, uh, 
we should accept that data is basically like money, you know, you can spend it and then someone, oh, okay, and in case of data also once someone has it, it has also the power. You, you uh, give uh, a certain part of your privacy in terms of power to another body. But you also get something from it and that's the convenience and that's the uh, usability and your car, you, I don't know, you enter your car, you don't even have to tell the car where to go, it already knows. Yeah. So um, this debate and, and the other uh, question is um, about, yeah, I mean, where is this all leading? I mean, what, what do we want the, the chatbot ultimately to be? You know, do you want it to be um, just a, someone who is like a co-pilot <laughs> or an assistant? Do you want it to be uh, another social entity you can always entertain yourself with or yeah. Michael, good question. You, you, you told me about the film Her in the past. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, uh, 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 like uh, you're a fan of Star Trek. Uh, is, is that what you want or what's your idea? What do you want it to be? Uh, that's actually uh, that, uh, true. The, the science fiction movies and movies um, are giving us the ideas because um, they, they had been cre creative minds which create personality in movies where they think this is a useful uh, this is a useful entity in this in this movie so uh, movies gives gives up uh, gives us a good example how these kind of art, art uh, uh, this kind of artificial entities could work and there are many completely different examples like like hell in 2001 which is uh, like another person in this ship it's evil, but it's working w very well in its way. <laughs> and uh, R2D2 uh, is another example. It's uh, or, or the computer on uh, Starship Enterprise is. Uh, they are all very well examples of wh uh, where can uh, lead to. It's um, a bit uh, funny, but it's not. Uh, it's not a bad idea to to look at these kind of movies. And her is also a very good example. And. Um, um, the example of her is not so far away. If you if you take out the the love story, then uh, having a, a conversational interface as an operation system, uh, which works on your emails and your personal data, searches the web for you, doing some organization, booking flights, and this is a very good example. Okay, great. So we have a few minutes left here before the end and uh, yeah I, I think we can open it up uh, to um, questions also from the um, audience um, or, or, or to any statements uh, uh, how open will the conversational web be what does the audience think or do you have questions to the panelists no 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 questions Everyone's blood <laughs> because I, I, I see, no? <laughs> okay. 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 Ah, okay, so. Ah, there we go. It's great to think about what we can do with technology, but given the justifiable concern of populations and governments for data transfer, how do we see this playing out in uh, a fearful world? Uh, once again, technology comes to rescue. So <laughs> uh, I think uh, this, uh, the, the, the technology name is homomorphic encryption. Um, so what it comes through is the world has always been fearful. How do we share data with each other, right? Because data is money, it's your core assets. So there are new technology players nowadays uh, who are defining this in this way. For example, let's say A in terms of binary is some string. And then you encrypt it. The string becomes something else. Then there is B. Uh, let me simplify. Let's say 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. So 2 stands in binary, 0, 1, and then 3. If you encrypt with it uh, homomorphic encryption, uh, the result will be computed upon encrypted data, but not on exact value of 0, 1, plus 1, 1, right? 
So I have personally met recently a couple of uh, very interesting startups who are trying to crack this. Um, again, there are also bigger players who are not only coming through this fully homomorphic encryption technology, but they are also bringing in the legal team along with them. There is a startup I met. Uh, they call them some technology startup, but 21 team, 14 are lawyers, three are developers, and the rest are CEO and CXO. So you can now imagine the amount of uh, effort these guys are making to bring this, bring this cross transfer of data into play. But again, people are protected about that data. Those who are senior managers, it's very difficult to tell them that it's a technology game and you can win. It's, it's not. It's, it's very hard, hard world. So regulators and some, at some point of time, government has to jump in and say, as, as Michael was telling, the standardization. And once that standardization comes with this technology, etc., I think it will be, will be prevailing. Um, uh, privacy is a big issue in, for every company, and uh, there should be a very uh, high moral uh, level of taking care of the privacy of the data of the customer. So, um, if we if we don't see that uh, if if a company um, has not that moral standard and gives away uh, private data against the will of the of the customer, and that company doesn't break afterwards, then we have a very bad example that privacy is not uh, really taken care of and that, it's that every company can um, uh, uh, do whatever they want to and uh, so we will finally lose that, uh, uh, that privacy war against uh, what we actually want. So um, this, would, this should be a high standard and we should all take care about it and um, uh, the same must apply to governments. So um, if governments don't take care about privacy then it's a bad government. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, I totally agree. And, and uh, we, at least at Daimler, we take this very seriously. I mean, I'm not just saying this to make commercial here, but uh, it is a very serious issue, yeah, of data privacy and where we want to go in future. And um, yeah, I think this is uh, definitely a topic which also, unfortunately, I mean, you can't control everything in this world and there's also a, um, a trust level at some point. You, there's, it's like in every relationship you need to trust, but definitely enterprise and also governments should really take care of this, yeah, in a very standardized way. And the more data is out, unfortunately, the more governments could also use it to uh, suppress. That's true. Thanks Another question. The, yeah. yeah, thanks for the uh, talk you had there. So, and always around also the data issue. So, hypothesis. Yeah, would it make sense to show the consumer or the customer the value of his data in a, that's ongoing in a transaction? To make him aware what's really going on. To, to have a complete transparency. Transparency is always good because it creates trust. But maybe not just transparency, it's real value in money. In money, yeah. yeah but that's uh, difficult, dis difficult to say. I mean, I think it, uh, that's true. You, you, you should maybe, uh, there should be, the customer should understand what the value of the data is. It's like uh, also within a company, if we share information with a certain other section, we know that's helping that other section. And here, um, I think that should also apply for the customer enterprise relationship, yeah. But it's difficult to do, as, as Michael said, so how do you measure it in money, right? And then the question is, the, from the customer, why do I not get the money and why is the company getting it? Or like, is that, why don't I just not give them any data and just pay that amount of money for the same service? I mean, yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's a good question. But then again, the service can't be done with the, without the data. Okay, so never mind, my last point. I think uh, it, it depends on how educated the customer is, uh, of course, right? There will be a tiny percentage of customer who will be asking this, uh, that educate me and tell me why, 
what are the decisions that you are able to make with my, my data. Uh, and organizations are really, really protected about this, and they will be because it's bread and butter for them. So the only way you will make it happen, again, government, government has to say that, okay, you have to release, you are making money out of this guy. If you ask, how did you make money, explain to him. And that's what is happening in Europe as well with the whole GDPR policy changes. Uh, now the customer has the right to ask. Yeah, and to get a full review of all the data that the company has, yeah, that's true. So I see we're having a, a topic for a whole new panel here about uh, governments uh, and uh, I think like we haven't even touched uh, uh, this uh, if we look like also to countries like China where it's a completely different story uh, uh, also for conversational uh, uh, assistance and uh, for, for governments and d data privacy um, so uh, I think one thing that we see in the open source community people trust in the code so if they see the code well not everyone can read it but like to know that it is possible already is good. So uh, let's see what comes the next panel. I think we're opening this uh, topic and we haven't even like touched a lot of the questions and, and see what's coming, what's coming up, what, what will happen, right? So the future um, will be interesting. Thanks a lot for joining here and please uh, give a round of applause to our panelists. Okay. So we will continue here in a few minutes and uh, 